Hello and welcome to WMK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at medical topics. Today we're going to be looking at diabetic foot. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, drop a like, drop a comment, share the link, and grab your piece of paper, your pen, and let's go. Remember that diabetic foot is pretty much a complication of diabetes mellitus. If you haven't yet watched the video on diabetes, I will leave a card right here so you can go and check it out. And this is usually a complication of poorly controlled diabetes. And remember that someone with a diabetic foot may exhibit any of the following pathologies that may either be directly related to diabetes mellitus or maybe due to any long-term or chronic complications of the condition. So there may be things like infections, there may be diabetic foot ulcers, there may be neuropathic osteoarthropathy, you refer to that collectively as diabetic foot syndrome. In the pathogenesis of the condition, this is often characterized by a multifactorial etiology, meaning that there are many things that may cause diabetic foot. One thing that you really need to note is that the problem that's underlying people with diabetes is that they have a high blood glucose level. It could be due to peripheral resistance to insulin in the terms of type 2 diabetes, or it could be a deficiency, an absolute deficiency of insulin, for example, in type 1 diabetes. So whatever the case may be, the glucose is not really entering into the cells, and so there's a high concentration of glucose in the blood. So this high concentration of glucose in the blood may actually be also manifested in the tissues. So you have a high glucose concentration in the tissues. And remember that microorganisms that are present in the tissues or microorganisms that potentially can invade the tissues actually need this glucose to survive. So they use the glucose in order to produce energy. And remember that this now provides a good culture media for bacteria, so that's why infections are very common. That's the first and foremost thing that you need to understand about the pathogenesis of diabetic foot. The other thing is that with diabetes, there's what is known as diabetic microangiopathies, meaning that this is a problem that is affecting the small blood vessels. So in this case, there's some blockage of the microcirculation that may lead to some hypoxia. It has been seen that because of the high levels of glucose in the blood, it may actually lead to what is known as non-enzymatic glycosylation. So it means that the endothelium may begin to attach to some of the glucose molecules, and this may lead to endothelial dysfunction and endothelial damage. And eventually, this may actually result in deposition of fat in the walls of the blood vessels. It may result in a deposition of platelets in the, in the blood vessels. And then this may lead to blockage of these microcirculations that may lead to hypoxia. And remember that hypoxia is one of the things that's going to impede the inflammatory response. So it's going to reduce the ability of the tissues to respond to certain bacteria, to respond to certain infections. And then another thing that is seen in diabetic foot is that there is a diabetic atherosclerosis. Remember that atherosclerosis is just pretty much deposition of fats and um, associated substances in the walls of the blood vessels leading to thickening in the arteries. So there's going to be a reduced blood supply and remember whenever there's a reduced blood supply this may lead to gangrene. There may also be thrombosis that may be precipitated by this infective gangrene or this infection that may cause infective gangrene. And of course the mostly associated blood vessels include the plantar, the tibial, and the dorsalis pedis uh, vessels. So it means that you should be able to palpate for these vessels, especially the tibial vessels as well as the dorsalis pedis vessels in the lower foot. You should be able to palpate for these on your physical examination and ensure that they are there. When you are going to order investigations, you'll be checking for most of these blood vessels on your Doppler investigations to see if they're patent. Another factor that has been implicated is, of course, increase in glycosylated hemoglobin. So remember that you have a lot of this glucose that's present in the blood and it has no way to go. So some of it actually begins to attach to certain proteins in tissues. Some of them begins to attach to the endothelium. Some of the glucose attaches to the hemoglobin. So whenever now hemoglobin becomes glycosylated with, of course, glucose, this affects the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin. So it means that hemoglobin is less inclined to actually release oxygen when it reaches to the tissues. So it means that this is going to cause a defective oxygen dissociation curve, 
and this is going to lead to more hypoxia. And of course, at a tissue level, there is an increase in glycosylated tissue proteins, which obviously also prevents the oxygen utilization. And so this is going to further aggravate the hypoxia. And remember, whenever you do not have oxygen, you are also going to be damaging your tissues because tissues will be respiring via anaerobic respiration and even the amount of energy will be less. So it means that the sodium potassium ATPase pump will be functioning less. Less sodium will be pumped out of the cell. Sodium accumulates into the cell. Water can accumulate into the cell and this can lead to cellular damage. Then the other thing that may be there is diabetic neuropathy. So remember that these people have some sensory problems. So there may be sensory neuropathy where they are not able to actually feel or sense certain things. So there may be minor injuries that may go unnoticed and obviously the skin is an, is an intact thing through and throughout the body. So whenever there is an, a, a breakage in the skin, whenever there is a, a disruption of the continuity of the skin, then this makes it easy for microorganisms to enter and this breaks the defense. And usually the first sense that usually goes in diabetic patients is proprioception. So whenever you're examining a diabetic patient, check for proprioception because that's usually one of the first things that goes. Sometimes there may be some motor neuropathy that may lead to dysfunction of the muscles, the arches of the foot and the joints, and there may also be loss of reflexes of the foot, which may also lead to the patient being predisposed to trauma and abscess formation. And last but not least, there may be defective autonomic neuropathy, or there may be an autonomic neuropathy, which may lead to defective sweating and moisturizing of the skin. Remember, the autonomic nervous system is what really helps in homeostasis of the body. So if the skin is not producing these essential fatty acids, it's not producing this moisturizing substances that are supposed to keep the skin moist, then obviously it will dry up and this will lead to it being able to crack and predisposing them to infection. So all these things come into play and are associated factors that may lead to a person developing diabetic foot. So some clinical features that may be associated with the condition, you may get Absence of sensation, like I told you, the first sense that usually goes is proprioception, so learn how to check for that on your neurological examination. There may be absence of pulsations in the foot, so you may not be able to palpate the posterior tibial arteries, you may not be able to palpate the dorsalis pedis arteries. You should know where to palpate these arteries from. There may be some loss of joint movements, there may be some pain in the foot, there may be ulceration which may later lead to abscess formation, there may be change in the temperature as well as the color. And this is often seen when gangrene tends to set in. And in a selective number of patients, they may actually succumb to ketoacidosis. There may be septicemia and eventually myocardial infarction. So there's a classification that is there for diabetic foot, which is known as the uh, Medgets classification of diabetic foot. So it's graded from grade zero to grade five. So if a patient doesn't have any foot symptoms, aside pain, then you put them at grade zero because you, you do not notice anything. If they have a superficial ulcer, you put them at grade one. If they have a deep ulcer, you put it at grade two. If they have an ulcer, that is actually involving the bone. So if they have this necrotic tissue and you go for debridement and you actually realize that it's actually reaching the bone, then you put them at grade three. If they have a four foot gangrene, so if their four foot is affected, you put them at grade four. If the entire foot is affected, you put them at grade five. So this is the classification of a diabetic foot. Some investigations that you want to order in such patients, you want to do your urine for, of course, checking for ketones. You want to do a pass swab for culture, microscopy, and sensitivity because this is very important. You want to put the patient on antibiotics, which may help with the healing process. You want to order some blood investigations, such as a blood sugar and ketones, which may give you an idea of how high or low their blood glucose is. You may also want to order for glycosylated hemoglobin, which is going to give you an indication of how well this patient has been controlling their blood glucose over the past three months. Remember that hemoglobin and red blood cells usually have a lifespan of about 120 days, which is roughly three months. But a much more accurate test to do, which may actually point you towards the glycemic control, is what is known as glycosylated fructosamine. Then you may also want to order blood urea and serum creatinine and also do a lipid profile test because there may be some renal involvement. There is also atherosclerosis that's associated with diabetes. Then you, for the imaging, you want to do an x-ray of the part. You may look out for signs of osteomyelitis, which may be subtle, 
in the acute phase. So you may only see some periosteal reactions or there may be a periosteal elevation. But if you do suspect that this patient has osteomyelitis, you would be much more safer ordering for other more sensitive tests such as bone scans. You could order for that or you could order for an MRI of the bone, which may pick up these subtle changes in the early phases of osteomyelitis. Of course, in chronic osteomyelitis, you may get much more significant changes, the involucrum and sequestrum that may be there, so which is pretty much the new bone and the dead bone, respectively. Then you may also want to order a Doppler study of the lower limb to assess the patency of the blood vessels. You want to do an angiogram to see if there's any proximal blockage. You may also even order an abdominal ultrasound for the status of the abdominal aorta. And if this is a patient that's due to go to theater, you may even order for an ECG and an echo, depending on the age of the patient. So when it comes to management of the condition, remember our key here is to save the patient first. And the second thing is that we want to save the foot. And if we're saving the foot, make sure that you have a good supply, good blood supply to the foot. That's when it can be saved. Otherwise, you're more likely to amputate that foot than a foot that has a better blood supply. So you want to order for broad spectrum antibiotics. So pretty much combining metronidazole and uh, cephalosporins. Metronidazole is very good because it works against these anaerobic organisms, which usually tend to be found in these diabetic um, foot patients. Then you obviously also want to do a pass microscopy counter insensitivity. You may regularly dress the ulcer. Of course, use hydrogen peroxide, if, especially if there's pus. And it also helps in creating environment in the ulcer. You may give some drugs such as vasodilators. And these are the drugs that may be uh, helping with, of course, increasing the blood supply to the area. You want to have diabetic control. So if they are on insulin, please give them insulin. If they are on anti-oral hypoglycemic agents, then give them those and make sure that you actually do an RBS profile or RBS monitoring, random blood sugar, and their blood glucose should be controlled. If it's not, then you should work on adjusting the doses of the drugs. You also want them to be on a special diet for diabetic patients. Again, if you haven't yet watched the video on diabetes, I'll leave a card at the end. Then you also want to control obesity. So tell them to regularly exercise, but not exercise within the limit, not putting themselves at risk of damaging their foot or putting them at risk of developing other complications. You may also want to take the patient for surgical debridement. So this is basically if there's an abscess, you may want to drain the abscess. If there's dead tissue, you may want to cut it out. And after you have done this, if they're coming from, patient, uh, from the operating theater, the patient may be put on intravenous antibiotics, limb elevation to reduce the edema. You also want to continue their insulin control um, or insulin dosages or insulin drugs, give them insulin or give them their diabetic drugs, monitor their random blood sugar, give them some analgesia for the pain, because remember that if they're in a lot of pain, it also impairs the healing process. Then also monitor the urine output because they're obviously coming for theater, from theater rather, and monitor the vitals as well. You may also in some cases contemplate amputating the gangrenous area. So there may be features of gangrene, which remember gangrene could either be dry gangrene or wet gangrene, dry gangrene. Um, you have this dark area that is very stiff. And if there's a super added infection, then you refer to that as wet gangrene. So usually the level of amputation has to be decided by the skin changes that you may see. So the demarcation of the gangrene and of course the temperature changes or the Doppler studies. But the rule of thumb is you want to go to a level where you are sure that the blood vessels are patent and the infection hasn't yet spread to that area. And just some general advice for uh, patients with diabetes, care for the feet is very important. So they should at all cost avoid any injuries to the foot. So they should avoid walking barefoot because you can injure yourself if you step on certain things and you may not even be able to feel it because your sensation is impaired. They should avoid wearing tight shoes, especially tight closed shoes. Usually that's what precipitates the moisture to gather up as well as the injury to the foot. Then they should wear microcellular rubber footwear, which is quite expensive. But if you can afford it, then probably get, the, get that. It's much better for your feet. And then, of course, make sure that the feet are kept clean and dry. That's the very key thing because 
if they are kept moist, especially in between the toes and the clefts, then that harbors a very good environment for certain bacteria and certain fungi to begin to proliferate and cause a problem. And of course, you should avoid hyperkeratosis. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this review lecture video on diabetic foot. I hope you have learned so much from this. If you haven't yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Subscribe to the channel, drop a like for the algorithm, and also leave a comment in the section below on what you'd want to see on the channel. Thank you, and until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Bye-bye.